Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to What is Truth, Part 105. I'm John Barnwell here in the city of Detroit. And I'm here with the pastor, David William Perry, in the city of London in merry old England. So how you doing there, David? Well, as they say in the church, I'm freezing my ass off at the moment. <clears throat> um, we're, we're, we're not in winter yet, but every single day for the last couple of weeks has seemed like the bleak midwinter, as the hymn goes. It's been raining nonstop. Do you know there's still a hosepipe ban in London because we got no water? It's been raining like a monsoon for over two weeks now. It's freezing. It's windy. Um, my, my relocation to parts of Scotland really cannot be worse than this. You know, Scottish weather it's worse can't be. Oh, yeah, uh, Oswald Spengler, you didn't say the straits, John. <laughs> yeah, I, I was curious what would happen if I didn't. But I, I think they claw the straits. That, that's definitely a Pavlovian response. <laughs> um, not, I mean, I prefer the Pavlova made of made with cherries and, and raspberries, but you know, that's just me. Um, yeah, John Burnwell, greeting swanlings, right? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's cold, it's wet, it's damp, it's it can't be, you know, Scottish weather is worst, uh, it, it is, is on a par with this, so there we are. Um, apart from that, yeah, I mean, we're we're managing to get out the Nephilim anthropology talks finally. Um, we we've come to an arrangement, I think is the way you put it contractually, um, with one or two, basically one production companies, um, and they they're sort of selecting what they feel. Maybe they don't always make the right selections. They're selecting. So they're doing well at the minute. They're selecting what they feel reaches um, a, a, a good audience. I mean, we're getting a good audience. Um, we, we, I mean, part of the idea of the, the conference is that we examine a range of views in a, a very human, all too human attempt to unearth a great truth. You know, I personally do think there's a truth behind all this. What it is, I don't know. Um, and personally, I tend to have a very sort of, psychoanalytic view of it all you know there are monsters in the id there are there are giants in the subconscious so but that's just me um but so we have the scholarly end where you've got people like vladimir Wiedemann, you've got mog morgan um you know that sort of hard tight relatively acceptable uh mainstream scholarship and it goes outside that boundary but you know in that stream you get middle people who offer genuine alternatives to mainstream interpretation. Um, we're thinking of, I'm thinking of the marvellous Maria Wheatley um, and the extraordinary Hugh Newman. I'm thinking of them. Um, all the way to the completely outlandish and, dare I say, postmodern attitude, John. Well, you might want to give people... A, a more thorough characterization of exactly what you're talking about because you just um, kind of rolled into it like you're talking to me and uh, i'm sure there's people on here that have no idea what you're talking about right i i will be honored to explain that a little a little further i mean i have the honor and i mean that of being the founder of an idea which started in 2013 or thereabouts um, which at that time was a filler between two theatrical projects. It wasn't actually meant to be taken this seriously. Um, but what, what's, what's worse than not being in the notice of British theatricals? Nothing. You know, because work doesn't come your way. Um, I'm very choosy about what I do in British theatre, but you have to keep a profile going. So we were planning a conference way back when, uh, on the idea of the Nephilim and giants, you know, giants that have been discussed through history in every culture. Every culture has a different attitude to what it is they're dealing with, the phenomena of giantism, John. As in the scripture where it says, and there were giants in the earth yeah. in those days. Yeah. Um, 
which in itself is a, a riddling. I mean, you know, it's a biblical mystery. You know, who are the Nephilim? What are the Nephilim? Um, they are not fallen angels. Um, those are the watchers. Uh, the watchers or those who fly above which I notice some of my friends and colleagues in translation actually have trouble with in that section because most of the usual angel language actually isn't being used. Something else is being used. And you think, okay, so what are they getting at? Um, the offspring of this forbidden union between those who fly above and human women, um, no matter how one wants to interpret that, you know, some sort of interbreeding, metaphorical or otherwise, took place. It, it was forbidden. It's against the celestial laws, the laws of the cosmos, according to the Bible. Um, and that their offspring become the Nephilim, the, these unspeakable beings, the true enemies of the human race, um, who are antithetical to nearly everything we do, everything we're, we're trying to pursue, um, sometimes depicted as cannibalistic, sometimes depicted as giants. I mean, the word gigantes is actually used. Most of the time that does mean giant. Sometimes actually it doesn't, uh, but most of the time it does. So, you know, you're, you're left with a, a strange biblical picture of cannibalistic giants in the service of the powers of darkness, in the service of evil waging actual war on humankind. Um, and the Great Flood, according to a number of evangelical thinkers, everyone's got to remember, I'm not against evangelicals per se. I'm against certain attitudes that are, uh, are sort of not thought through, but that's a different thing. Actually, I've got a lot of time for Christian evangelicals. Um, you know, that certain evangelical schools, evangelical churches feel that this is a key not only to the great flood, you know, were, were the angels trying to wipe out their mistakes? Was God painting over the palette? Um, of course, some of them are said to have survived um, and still haunt in a number of ways, in a number of levels, on a number of levels, uh, human history until now. Um, I mean, there was meant to have been a dust up in Kandahar, good old Afghanistan between a group of American soldiers and a Nephilim quite recently, um, found in a cave. Um, I'm not talking about Amer American military tactics, but there must be another way for just going in somewhere and covering everything with bullets and then wondering what it was. You know, it must be a different way of doing things. John. Well, the, as the story goes, he came after them first. Ah, uh, now. Yeah, but is it that depends which version of the story you're listening to. Right, but right, let's go with that one. Let's go with that one. <laughs> um, so they, they defended themselves, and you've got this sort of what was it? I can't remember, 15 foot blue, yeah. something or other. Yeah, what are you going to do when you got a 15 foot character running at you with a, with a tree for a club? You know, it's like, yeah, I, I, I think machine guns are quite a good answer, actually. Um, so anyway, that you know, the stories continue. Back in 2013, we weren't thinking that. We were thinking, let's do something outlandish, surreal, postmodern, on ideas, the ideas of giants, the ideas of, you know, mon monster giant, big things. And we were going to look at crystal skulls, UFOs, et cetera, et cetera, bloodlines. Um, that idea fell apart because of funding issues. And it was two years ago that my partner said, actually, that's a good idea. Maybe we should do something with it. Um, so we held an online session um, in the April. Um, one year, two years, one year. Yeah, April 2020. We held um, an online session, which was very successful, uh, with a number of speakers. As I say, we, we deliberately chose an, an interdisciplinary approach. You know, nobody, I don't want anybody preaching. Uh, we've all got to say, you know, this is what we think according to the evidence this is how we see things, because I think that's a way people, you know, people do uncover great secrets. Um, that has proved to be a massive success. Uh, we held our second meeting because, of course, that, that was during the lockdowns. We held our second meeting at the Royal Asiatic Society um, with 100 seats uh, and online coverage. Um, again, uh, a more of a muted success than I'd like, but a success. 
And we've recently held uh, the third in what is becoming an annual meeting now um, at the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators uh, in Bloomsbury Square, which is five minutes from the British Museum. Um, and we have an agreement now with the Zohar Entertainment Group um, that they are going to show certain of the talks from those three sessions. Um, they've already they already ran a, a compilation of four, you know, a trial run pilot, as they used to say, which got an enormous number of views. Um, and now they're sort of going through our material. Uh, you know, Vitaly, if you're looking, thank you for the support and everything. It's really appreciated. John. Well, I can say I knew you when. <laughs> oh. Um, let, well, no, let, let me put that in financial context. Um, we're only just managing to cover certain speakers' expenses at the minute because it's all outgoing and very little incoming. Um, also, it's meant to be a fundraiser for my little chapel, which hasn't made a penny. Um, it's also meant to be a little fundraiser for us, and we're the ones paying out at the minute. So that, that, none of, that, it's not working on that level yet. But, you know, uh, uh, I think it's early days. I mean, what I didn't realise is that we touched a nerve. I really didn't realise that. Um, so we're working with Zohar at the minute and their, their ancient secret discoveries. Ancient secret discoveries were mainly on their channel. Uh, I don't know if some of the talks are coming out on Zohar itself. I noticed one or two of the talks of, of Gaia originals. What have they got to bloody do with it, John? Yeah. Well, in keeping with the theme that we've attempted to races approach it, races. <laughs> it you know, it's it's uh, wonder on reverence. So you got the wonder aspect going very strong and the awe aspect. The the question is the the reverence part. It's it's and when you delve into like Rudolf Steiner's uh well, the, the most to the point lecture cycle or book uh, would be that uh, Atlantis and Lemuria uh, lecture cycle where he goes over the whole thing. And you offered to have me join you. And, and I don't, I'm not akin to the idea of getting in there with competing uh, worldviews and, and throwing it out there in that fashion. And, but and I've noticed that that's not uncommon amongst anthroposophists, you know, because to be able to approach the work of Rudolf Steiner, you have to realize that Earth evolution was a condensation, that it was something that came down through the levels of being and then precipitated into the physical plane. And so, the early uh, examples of humanoid type beings are beings that con they, they came into physical physicality early. And that doesn't mean that everybody else was doing the same thing. And so that's, that's the basic, most fundamental distinction between uh, Rudolf Steiner's work and almost all the researchers that you're making reference to. So it's like, it, it gets into the level of fairy tales, you know, with the Knights of King Arthur fighting dragons and giants kind of thing. And they go, well, you know, that's just stuff. But the, I guess the important thing, because when you get into the wonder awe and reverence, then you're getting into the arena of uh, fairy tales. Uh, like And like what Albert Einstein said, he said, if you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be geniuses, read them more fairy tales. When I examine myself and my methods of thought, I come to the conclusion that the gift of fantasy has meant more to me than any abstract positive thinking. So there you have it from one of their heroes. And but Rudolf Steiner does make the point. He says, you can't, in the lecture cycle on initiation that I've been referencing a lot lately, he says, well, you know, you can't really explain this uh, to the way people think today. And I'm, of course, paraphrasing. 
And so it's it's easier for people to come into a relationship with the reality behind all the words and all the talk and everything is by providing them with a picture. And that's why like in Waldorf education, they work with the myths and legends and leave the children free to, to uh, imagine in, in the way in which uh, Albert Einstein was just referring and that that's very, very healthy because it's free. You, you, you're given a lot of, of room to move. You're not being locked in, you know, teaching three-year-olds calculus or something, you know, it's like uh, that there's a certain uh, way in which these things occur. And if you get into some of the lecture cycles, I don't know if anybody's read any of them or anything, and, and it doesn't matter, but in the lecture cycle on wonder, Rudolf Steiner talks about how within the Greek culture, the mythos of the, mythos of the Greeks, that it was, Demeter that, that was the provider of, of that which streamed into mankind and provided them with the basis for being able to perceive the beings, uh, the angels and archangels and things of that nature. And that in their mythos, the story, and her daughter Persephone is raped by Pluto. And Pluto represents like the physical realm. And so it's that fall and that principle goes from being streamed into so we could be conscious of the astral world and all of that to where it goes into a realm to where it works in us in the unconscious. And so then you have the rape of Iphigenia and, and that whole scenario that's, that's dealt with in the stories in ancient Greek is pertaining to that, that resting away from the perception of the spiritual world and entering into the realm that would develop abstract thinking ultimately following Thales and the early pre-Socratic philosophers and all of that. But Rudolf Steiner makes the point is that there's this relationship to the spiritual world that ties very much into the, the uh, sentient soul of the ancient Egyptian period. And now that we move into the future, we have these legends like the Grail legends that provide a basis within the intellectual soul period, which went through the Greco-Roman period into the Middle Ages. But the culmination of the story of the Grail is Parsifal. And Parsifal is the initiate who consolidates the consciousness soul. And that's the, the age in which we're in so that this grail story is that which points towards our current challenge of development. None of which would have been discussed at the conference. Well, that's because I'm trying to approach this anthroposophist called John Barnwell, who keeps playing hard to get. Um, don't worry, you're still in my sights. You're still in my sights. Um, what I can't do as the convener is, is sort of ramming anthroposophy the minute I get the chance. Um, but this is the perfect anthroposophical project. I mean, we have approached um, the Anthroposophical Society UK to give us some support for, the, for, for their own reasons. They've decided that that's not going to happen at the moment, um, which I don't know, I find a little frustrating, if I'm honest, because this is the par excellence anthroposophical project. Um, and yeah, I've still got you in my sights. Certain things you said in that wonderful book of yours are touched very clearly on this field. And what you said about the Norse myths actually touched very nicely into this field. Um, so I suppose I'll end there by saying if any, if any of our viewers get the chance, like and subscribe this channel first, but go and look at Ancient Secret Discoveries, etc. You might find something interesting. Um, which is now definitely um, the forerunner of next year. Um, we will be holding another Nephilim Anthropology Conference, as I say, probably in Scotland, because my partner and I uh, have had enough of war-torn Britain, war-torn England, I can't stand much more, um, and are going to a sort of a, a lovely little Scottish isle um, and just to be away from it. So probably, well, I'll just finish this bit, John. I'm probably going to get my, my chums at the University of Glasgow into various types of arm lock until they agree that that, that will be hosted by them. 
Sean. Ah, uh, Scotland. Yes. Uh, well, yeah. Look, look at the Romans. They come in. They come into England. They they can't uh, make their way into the city of London. That's too strongly guarded. So they cut a, a deal with with the dwellers of the city of London. That stands to this day, by the way. The city of London has their own deal. That's separate from everywhere else in Britain. And it was extended by uh, William the Conqueror because he couldn't, he couldn't assault it that way either. And, but that uh, the city of London became a trading outpost for the Romans. And the Romans attempted to venture forth into Scotland. But they got to a certain point and they ran into the Campbell clan. And uh, my old partner in music business, Bobby Hankins, is, his mother's a Campbell, and I go with him to his family reunions, and everybody's like six foot five, six foot seven, you know, there's these giant people, you know. And when the Romans encountered that, they kind of said, Well, let's stop here. And they built Hadrian's Wall. And so you have that long wall to protect the Romans from the Campbells, basically. <laughs> they weren't the only uh, clan there, but they're. They were uh, really central in that whole uh, adventure. And so you're going into Scotland. I, Scotland, to me, is quite fascinating. Yeah, I mean, one of the great metaphysical mysteries, I agree, is it, it's a wonderful country. Uh, it, it's traditions. It's even the cooking. I like the cooking, believe it or not. It's legends. It's, it's customs. They're, they're, they're beautifully done. Um, oh my God, John's doing it again, giving me a sort of temporary heart failure. Um, I don't know what he's doing, so I'll, I'll keep talking, I suppose. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the perfect place to hold this type of event. I mean, admit legendary permutations like the Campbells when they won the war. It wasn't always against the English. Normally it was against each other. Oswald Spengler, the Scots are the real Freemasons, right? Yeah, that's what they say. Step outside and say it's Scotty. Um, not there's anything to do with me. Um, <clears throat> oh, God. Do you know, I, I've been to do's at Grand Lodge in, in London, in Great Queen Street. You just get sick. You get sick of two things, all the toasting. You know, oh, my God, what's that? All right. Master Masons... Right, John, you have to read that out. It's floating uh, to the Crown of Scotland and their works. Oh, my God, right. Uh, Reverend Robert Scott Milne. Oh, my God, I think I know that name. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Well, that's because it was uh, Masonic secrets. See? But <laughs> no, yeah, they were the uh, the royal builders, and the tradition within that's covered in my book somewhat is the, that whole idea of that this mystery stream continued from the Knights Templar and, and streamed into the Freemasonic uh, order in Scotland. And if you look at like the Sinclair family, that were the, became the ancestral uh, heads of the order in Scotland. And you look at uh, the work that was done on the cathedrals in the Middle Ages, when the Templars came along, all of a sudden they started building Gothic cathedrals. And in the demise of the Knights Templar, they stopped building Gothic cathedrals. So it was a, a complete synchronization of the of the timelines, which is would be to the fact that the individuals handling the organization of the building of the cathedrals was through the Knights Templar. That, and they were the ones that handled the finances to be able to pay the workers and all of that and working in consort with the 
the trade unions, the builder trade unions. And so out of that builder's uh, tradition came the rights of Freemasonry until it was uh, Elias Ashmole, who was contemporary with, uh, you know, like some of the early Freemasons that are known in England. And he is the first British individual who is actually, they have a, a, a note of him in one of his letters. I used to have his three volume set of uh, the letters of I, Elias Ashmole, in which he discusses uh, his taking the degree work in Freemasonry as, but not as an operative Mason, as a speculative Mason. So somebody who's not an architect or a builder or anything like that, which that began, you know, around that time. And uh, so, there, but there's this whole discrepancy in historians. And, but the, the, the facts are there. I mean, just go to that one book I just showed you and, and it shows that it, it's the Scottish origin as much as the British would like to make people think that, that they were the ones that came up with it. They did come up with certain speculative aspects of it. I hope that answers your question. I hope it does do too, because I'm a complete agnostic on all of this. Um, you know, it's interesting in the background. Um, I know Andrew Goff, uh, my dear friend, was a Mason at one point. Um, he speaks very highly of it, you know, apart from the nonsense and boulder dash that seems to be going around it, going around that phenomenon recently. Certainly it was a force for the good uh, for a number of, of, of decades, if not a hundred, couple of hundred years. What's happened to it now? I don't know. I'm not a Mason. And of course, uh, I don't know. Is Leo is Leo in or is he out at the minute? Because it's so it's, it's like someone with trousers coming up and down again. You know, are they up or are they down again? Do you, uh, what? you can't hear you, John. I haven't spoken to Leo in some time. You know, he's busy off doing what he does. And uh there, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody that knows more about current events regarding uh, Freemasonic lodges on the continent and uh, Rome, Church of Rome, and the machinations in there. And Osco, he used to live in Russia even. And uh, so, yeah, he's a, he's an interesting character. But the, the coming from it from a different vantage point, though, because he's. He's very knowledgeable about many things, but he's not conversing with the work of Gus Steiner. And there, I've tried to point out before that there are people that work in the esoteric that have a cosmology and a cosmogony. Cosmogony has to do with the creation of the cosmos. And so you find that in The Secret Doctrine of Madame Blavatsky and in The Transcendental Universe by C.G. Harrison and throughout the work of Rudolf Steiner, you have the most developed expression of that whole idea of the Mahamanvantara and Manvantaras as they're described in the ancient Hindu tradition, but that genesis in time. And uh, of course, preceding time, starting from old Saturn with the primal physical that's merely warmth to old sun where light enters into the world and that sets a basis for the etheric and then you have in old moon you have the uh, astral realm which is the realm of the animals so you have mineral plant animal and then we're in the fourth that's earth and that's human that's where we receive our ego as a donation from the divine spiritual beings and is made reference to in scripture as curios and that's that majority of your individual ego of which you're totally oblivious and but it's out of one's uh working with the spiritual exercise for example in knowledge of higher worlds that can can stimulate the development of your chakras so that you can begin to have a, a sufficient excess of capacity to be able to use that to come into relationship with the supersensible. 
And so it, you get that thing that I was describing earlier of Demeter uh, raying it in and then it becoming unconscious with, through her, her daughter Persephone and then uh, the rape of Persephone by Pluto, by the physical world. And then you have uh, the Iphigenia story and you have that kind of, there's a principle that Rudolf Steiner talks about that that is in mankind. It's mentioned in the lecture cycle on initiation. He says that in the early periods, we had a place of soul in us that was awakened so that we could have this relationship. But through the development of mankind, entering into the sense-related thinking, that, that realm of being went dark. It, it, it basically became like deadened. And it's that challenge of the deadened realm that, that we're looking at here in the mystery of evil in the fifth post-Atlantean period of the conscious of soul. So that the grail impulse has to do with developing the capacities, the spiritual capacities to have a relationship with the divine spiritual beings and overcome the challenges that assert themselves through the in intervention of Lucifer and Araman within that darkened realm of soul. And so it's be able to shine a light in there and that actually when one works in that way, what happens is your development results from you getting the attention of the divine spiritual beings, them noticing that you're striving towards the divine spiritual worlds and it's through their working with your own uh, capacity that you develop into uh, clairvoyance and perception in the spiritual soul and spiritual worlds. And so that's quite different than any narrative that I'm sure you heard at your conference. Well, I mean, well, as I say, you know, what we're doing is we're developing not only the panel as we go along, so there are permanent panelists and there are guest panelists. We're also extending our, our project as we go along. I mean, next year, because it will always be around the end of October, I think that seems to be a good a good time for us around Halloween. Um, you know what we do. What I want is a weekend next year. I want a day of talks. I want a couple of workshops, and certainly we're thinking of tours to Rosalind Chapel. I mean, the absolutely astonishing Maria Wheatley. Maria, darling, I absolutely love you. We all love you. She's already planning excursions uh, from the conference to Rosalind Chapel. Um, and, you know, how we go into that. Because uh, we're, we're determined to, I'll just say this, John, unlike most other conferences in this country, um, that's not necessarily a dig because we all have different pressures on us. We're doing our absolute best to keep this accessible through finance, you know, so anyone can go. But, but you know, costs do arise and we must do right by the speakers. So we, we have to charge money. You know, there's this thing going around at the moment that all content should be free. You know, take my jumper in the house as well. You know, I mean, what, what do you want me to do? But we are doing our best to keep everything very, very accessible. And the wonderful Maria is bending over backwards to say, well, look, you know, we, we've had the speakers, we've had the theorists, and now let's look at an amazing building. And I think that will be probably be on the Sunday. So we'll have a Friday, you know, warm up, uh, maybe workshops get together, we'll have the Saturday of talks, the Sunday of tours. And yet I'm determined to get you. I just don't know how I do it yet. John. Yeah. So, uh, Sidestepping the whole thing is coming into a relationship with all of this is, is that which is the challenge and to be able to find a wholesome relationship to it because some of these things are very challenging and can be quite spooky, so to speak, but needn't worry about it, you know, that the the, as Rudolf Steiner says, and I frequently say, Christ is infinitely more powerful than the adversaries is for an Araman or Satan. And so if one has found your way within that 
particular realm of blessing, then you need to worry yourself about it. In fact, we I've been doing interviews with Douglas Gabriel over on his channel, and I think I'm going to transport it over here and put them together in a file so people can come to my channel and find them, because if people don't know about his channel, they wouldn't find them. But uh, he started out at age 14 as an exorcist, and uh, which is uh, when a priest took him under his wing, which he finally figured out was his real father. And uh, so that's an interesting story because Douglas is one of the few people I can actually talk to for any uh, great lengths regarding many of the things that I like to talk about, being that we both have an ongoing friendship of some 45 to 50 years uh, within the, the uh, thoughts, thought environment of Rudolf Steiner's work. And so that, that's a very unique place to, to have a friendship exist because God knows it's challenging. Rudolf Steiner's collected edition is 36 and a half feet of shelf space. <laughs> well, that's, I've forgotten the point. I mean, maybe we can get a three-way thing going. Uh, that might be well. You know, I mean, <sighs> I mean, anthroposophy is one of the things I'm aiming at in all of this. But what I can't do as convener and be fair to everybody is ram that home as a sort of a, an either direct or hidden agenda. I mean, that would just be unfair to everybody. Um, I do think very, very strongly it raises clearly anthroposophical issues. Um, it's just a great shame that uh, the people we've talked to at the society don't seem to think that. Because um, I, I, you know, what, what, what do you want then as a series of anthroposophical issues? Um, and that's no disrespect. There's no nastiness to them. I mean, I, we, we get on very well with them. But I did think, if I'm honest, it was a little short-sighted that we're we're sort of kicked into touch, John. Well, again, it's it's when you when you take the the concept of, of historical morphology. Okay, and, and you look at that, and then when you realize that unless you have at least a, a grasp of what I'm talking about, uh, it's very challenging to be able to have a conversation with somebody about those types of subjects because Rudolf Steiner's vantage point on it is so radically different, and most of the critics of Rudolf Steiner that you'll run into, it's very clear that they haven't really read Rudolf Steiner and they don't understand what he's talking about. And so it's to try and get in there in the competing uh, realm uh, it, because you'd have to almost like dismiss the conclusions of many of these people because, for example, okay, I'll give you an example. If you just go to the Greek myths, Rudolf Steiner, when he's talking about uh, the entourage of, of Dionysius, you know, and there's that image in the in the uh, black pottery and, and in the frescoes of Dionysius riding on a spotted panther, right? And he has this entourage behind him of, of fawns, which are like, you know, little, little goat-like guys and and all these various uh, mythological type figures. And if you go to, that's the early Dionysus. And if you go to that Dionysus, you find that what that is, is that's an imagination of that relationship to the spiritual world and, and, and the perception of, of being. So that there, it is kind of like Lord of the Rings. There are all these other beings running around, but they're not physical. And so it becomes extremely challenging to try and have a meaningful conversation and, and not appear dismissive or rude or something because if they don't if they don't know those things, if they can't approach it in that way, then they can't even wrap their head around it. Yeah, I think it's still worth trying. Um, and I think, you know, the... The clash of ideas is always rewarding. Um, and if anthroposophy is also a science, then it must uh, do that. Well, what happens is because, see, in a situation like that, 
a lot of the things that I've said, even though this is a public forum, so to speak, but you could tell by the, the few people that listen to it that it's only people with certain inclinations. And to take it and go, it was more like when we were doing uh, our show with Leo Zagami and, and uh, Roseanne Barr and, and Lowell. And, but there, it was like a presentation, like I had somebody order one of my books, one of Roseanne Barr's uh, fans, right? And they shot me back a, a message like they were wondering what's up with this book. You know, it's like, it's like, I didn't really write it for somebody who doesn't really have that striving within them that, that they're they're asking the question. You know, they have that wonder. They're they're trying to figure out uh, the relationship to the spiritual world. It's the quest of the Grail. That's what that is. And it isn't. I I'm not a bully in that. I don't I don't insist that other people think. In fact, I have. A lot of friends that thought they knew me really well, and I started doing these podcasts, and they're like, what the? Because they didn't know that part of myself because it doesn't come up because the, it, it, we're, our relationship isn't in that way. And so you find that anthroposophists tend to be very circumspect. I mean, I can remember back at the Waldorf Institute, you know, and the teachers there from London and Vienna and Germany and all these people. And, Oft times you'd ask them a question and they'd just look at you. They wouldn't even say anything, but I'd end up finding the answer to it through my own uh, strivings. And so it's it's something, see, it, that's that third part of it, because you got the wonder, you got the wonder, you got the awe, because like, wow, this is incredible, but there's no reverence, see? And, and it, this is like, this is the sacred mystery knowledge from the, the ancient Eleusinian uh, Egyptian mysteries, the Attic mysteries, the ancient Persian. You know, this is, this is a, a sacred tradition. And these are really, uh, you know, and, but we're not uptight about it. I mean, Rudolf Steiner was famous. He was always telling jokes, you know. So it's all very lighthearted, but it, it, it's same token striving for that which is is real is as clearly as one can and leaving people free to think whatever they think about it yeah, I, i'm an admirer not only of shakespeare but of his great rival ben johnson um who thought that if you had to pull a po face when you were talking about knowledge there was something deeply wrong um i've always been of that school um yeah, all I can say is we had uh, an in-person audience of 60 uh, last time we met, all of whom were appreciative of what we were doing and would love to ask you questions. I know that already. They've all pledged to return next year. And we're growing in momentum. I think it's very much, you know, a, a sort of almost Sufi, you know, the, these are my views. These are why, this is why I've arrived at those views. What do you think? Um, that's the attitude we've adopted on the panel. It's an attitude I insist on. Or, by the way, it's my show. Goodbye. Um, so, you know, and I, I found all the panelists actually feel very protective of each other while, while they respect each other's space. Um, I think you'd find that very, very uh, uh, amenable. John? Well, here's a, a, a little... Quote by Rudolf Steiner, above all, you must get rid of the notion that your opinion is worth more than that of other people. Self-knowledge is one of the hardest things to acquire, and it is precisely those who think they know themselves best who are most likely to be deceived. They think too much about themselves. You should get out of the habit of fixing your attention on yourself and constantly using the word I. I think, I believe, I consider this right. And so you you have that, yes, that there's absolutely that respect that the other person is free to, to develop or not develop uh, however they so choose. And that, that that's the key of understanding anthroposophy is that it lives within a sphere of freedom. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're progressing Hopefully I can inveigle you into the whole process 
in 2023 uh, because we need a firm anthroposophical voice, which isn't mine. Um, And, you know, see where we go from there. I mean, one of the issues that does keep coming up, which you'll like as a link, is the issue of race and ethnicity. Um, I, as I said, you know, I said at the beginning, I've got this sort of psycho therapeutic, psychiatric view of it all. Um, I can deal with disembodied, gigantic energies. I can't go personally along the route of some of the panellists where you're talking about some big dudes. I mean, my God, you know, know, the sort of people you couldn't go to a restaurant with because they wouldn't fit in. (laughs) Um, You know, so are we looking at that? I don't know. But certainly I personally find that a little more difficult to digest. Um, you know, and, and we, I'll just say one thing as a taster for next year because I'm going to get you in somehow. I mean, Ali Marzuli um, is a, a name I've heard of and respect. Uh, we, I'm not sure we agree on too much, but that's not the issue. Um, he's already in negotiation with us for next year. I think I mentioned that Oscar Toe, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is a lovely thing to read this time of year. Do you like the work? I absolutely love the work, and I think John does too. Although, of Actually, course, when, great... I was, when I was in grade school, I I got to be the Green Knight in a in a school play. Oh, although of course there is no Green Green Knight. Uh, um, actually, it's Sir Bertilac who has been transformed by the magic of Morgan Le Fay. It's all a phantasm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So be careful. Well, I, you know. Uh, Rudolf Steiner says, uh, suppose, for instance, that someone is very clever. If he displays his cleverness in the company of people who are not so clever, his behavior will be very ill-timed. He will be doing it only to please his own egoism. He ought to adapt his response to the needs and capacities of others. That's from the At the Gates of Spiritual Science, Lecture 15, Collected Works 95. So you kind of have that that whole idea. Of, it's like uh, the reference I keep making to uh, my friend uh, Joe Visconti, who went asked a Catholic priest about Rudolf Steiner, and the priest reiterated, "Well, Rudolf Steiner, that's only for the adult Catholics, you know." And so you have this thing, and it's something that. Uh, you know, they don't push Rudolf Steiner's works in Waldorf schools. Kids that aren't in there reading Steiner books. It's something that uh, one comes to or not on one's own. And so in the Waldorf schools, what you're going to see is myths and legends and all of that that synchronize with the developmental stages of childhood as so that there could be this healthy imaginative development like what the quote that I read from uh, Albert Einstein was was saying, you know, if you want your kids to be smart, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be geniuses, then read them even more fairy tales. So that's that whole idea of being able to have this kind of abundance of uh, relationship to that world of wonder, awe, and reverence. But it's really hard to get there without the reverence part, and that's that's the bugaboo for the world of science, really. Yeah, I think I've said on this show before. You know, I've got weird connections with the Cambridge atheists. What can you do? Um, and certainly, they have them manifestly lacking in reverence. Um, but, you know, I think my view is we've just all got to keep open minds and keep talking and great truths will be revealed. I really do think that, um, including the one about races and ethnicities. I'm sick of Rudolf Steiner being accused of racism. Um, I'm you know, Just because one talks about race, it doesn't mean one is a racist. You know, that sort of nonsense really has to go. Um, I'm tired of, of extreme right wing accusations myself if anything i'm on the verge of becoming a total como at the minute with british politics in the state it's in yes john well actually if for people that actually are aware of rudolf steiner's words on the topic one would know that uh, 
he says that that word race is only relevant uh, up until the, the Atlantean, about really uh, from the middle to the end of the Atlantean period. So that uh, it's really not even correct to, to use it. And that's why he changed the terminology that was being used by the Theosophical Society for sub races and all that. And he shifted it into cultural ages because the whole or the fundamental basis of understanding uh, Udo Steiner's view of history has to do, uh, it's, it's more than, than race, it's, it's something about geography. And it's the, if you wanted to come in contact with particular cultural uh, streams, you had to go there. You know, if you wanted, if you wanted to go through the, the ancient Irish mysteries that were uh, really an extension of the ancient mysteries of Atlantis, you had to go to Ireland. You couldn't just go down to downtown and, and go check out one of their places. It's not like that. You had to go and go through a, a severe discipline. And it, it said that people traveled from as far away as India to get to Ireland to go through the Hibernian mysteries. And so the ancient world is very different than, than a lot of people think of it. It's not just a bunch of people like us that just don't have the same information. The Rudolf Steiner's view is radically different from that, that they had capacities of clairvoyance. And if you go back to their own writing, if you go back and read like uh, some of the comments by uh, the the early Greek writers talking to the Egyptians and, you know, they say, well, you know, who ruled your countries? And they say, well, originally it was the gods, right? And that's what they're saying. And that what they're referring to is the divine spiritual beings. And then when you go into that early period, you have this, this uh, uh, transcendental relationship to the divine spiritual beings that serves as a guide for the development of culture. And if you go to all ancient cultures, you'll find that they reference that a certain point in their history where, well, this this guy showed up and he taught us how to do, you know, grow corn and build buildings and an alphabet. And they, they have that kind of foundation myth in, in them becoming actually a, a nation of people or tribe or what have you. But that it's it's very unique according to where you are and according to what time that event took place. And so it's really one of the most fascinating subject, subjects you can study. And, and But again, keeping in mind that Rudolf Steiner is the most difficult subject you can study. Yeah, I mean, Steiner is the, the perfect example of somebody who bends over backwards to actually balance the issue. I, you know, I completely agree there. Why isn't anybody saying that? Although I'm sympathetic to the Theosophical Society in keeping those words, the minute we're outside Europe and America, it's odd if you're not using those words. You know, we've, we've got to stop. There's a certain parochialism that, you know, we are the centre of the universe still. Um, and if you go, say, to India, or if one goes to my beloved Central Asia, if, you, if you're not using words like that, they normally lose interest because they don't think you're educated enough to discuss those issues. Uh, so one has to remember, you know, there's certain Eurocentrism, uh, if one isn't careful, whereby those things are, are undiscussable with people who need and, you know, we'd want to discuss these things with. And certainly if we're moving from bodies, um, as I say, Ali Marzuli wants to bring in, I think I've mentioned this before, some bones and what have you. You know, the minute we're getting past that stage and looking at subtleties like folk souls, uh, zeitgeists, you know, the minute we're looking at real realities, but subtleties <clears throat> along those lines, it becomes much more difficult, you know, by, by nearly by, by, you know, for obvious reasons that we can't pin them down as easily. Maybe that type of vocabulary is actually helpful. Um, certainly, I don't want to abandon the phrase folk soul. I find it very instructive. It te teaches me a lot. You know, words must mean something. There, there's this terrible woke attitude. You know, and partly I'm, I don't know, partly I'm sort of sympathetic to it. As Shakespeare would have said, you know, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. 
So he's got that sort of Wittgensteinian attitude. You know, is it the label or the phenomena that actually is important? Of course, it's the phenomena. But, yeah, there's the real danger of going too far and going too far too quickly, whereby you're not actually evolving the language and the types of linguistic expression you're, you're using to frame the, the subjects uh, of a discussion. You're actually making the subject uh, a sort of pre-linguistic or, or, or po I can't say post-linguistic because it's not an advance. One, one has actually sunk back to a level whereby the labels don't fit the phenomena, they don't fit the description anymore. And therefore nobody knows what they're talking about. And of course, that's one of George Orwell's nightmares. Um, you know, Newspeak, as it is in 1984, where what the party have done, um, I mean, they're, they're great war, apart from on the proletariat, is on language itself. They want to simplify all forms of communication so certain types of thinking and certain types of attitude simply cannot arise. Um, and this is brought up a couple of times in the text, to, to my mind, the most sinister and chilling aspects of those texts, because uh, apart from the fact you get one or two gags out of it, like O'Brien, you know, the senior party member who, who tortures Winston, um, you know, he, he's writing for what is clearly something like the Times or the Guardian. So, in other words, you've got the party member contributing regularly to a, a, a firm British institution, a newspaper that's respected. And, you know, he's, he's deliberately minimising what he's saying uh, to make sure the phenomena fits what they want as opposed to reality. Uh, I think the phrase O'Brien uses is double quack. You know, quack, 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 quack. Because it, it's nonsense, and all of course, the newspapers are terrified of him because he's a senior party official, so they wouldn't dare go against anything he says. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's the woke thing. Do you know, I'm, I'm half sympathetic. I promise I'll finish up. I'm half sympathetic to the intention, but I'm certainly not uh, as sympathetic to the type of execution that, 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 that is given to the intention. All this sort of belligerent, wicked silencing of other people's opinions. That, for me, will always be wrong, John. Yeah, well, that you get that with uh, the forces of materialism. That comes with the package. Rita Steiner says, and I quote, it is of the first importance that there should be, in this present time, a certain number of people who know where man stands in his spiritual evolution and know also what must be the next step if civilization is not to go completely under. For what is happening today? In speaking to you, my dear friends, I can use anthroposophical terminology and say at once that the aramonic forces which are at work whenever a man thinks or acts on a materialistic basis are in our day trying to chain man to the earth by gaining possession of his intellect. They are at this moment very powerful, these aramonic forces, and they are searching out all kinds of ways to get access to the souls of men with the object of enticing them to the adoption of a purely materialistic outlook, a purely intellectual understanding of the world. It is on this account important that there should be, as I said, a certain number of persons who know how the evolution of man has to proceed in order for him to reach his goal. And that's from uh, in London, April 24, 1922, Collected Works 211, the planetary spheres and their influence on man's life on earth and in the spiritual world. And so when you, when you look at it from that standpoint, then you, you'll see that, that when you uh, arrive at your ideas, there's something behind the ideas that you're presenting. And so when you present these materialistic descriptions of the world, what is behind that description? It's these harmonic beings, okay? Just so we're clear on that. Okay, and so that if you confine yourself to that as your storyboard, then you're not, it's like, like uh, 
there's no way for the the spiritual world to get in because it's not included, so to speak, in those equations. And and so that's why within anthroposophy, uh, we like to work so much with the arts because there's a greater freedom in there. We we do, of course, have science and it's spiritual science, but you have to develop the the vocabulary to be able to include in your uh, exchanges concepts that pertain to this whole concept of, of the divine spiritual world and how it relates to life on earth, which is very challenging. You know, it's a lifetime study. It's like when, uh, you know, Owen Barfield introduced uh, C.S. Lewis to the work of Ross Steiner. And, and at the time, C.S. Lewis was like the biggest radio personality in Britain. And he was doing those those talks that, that were so famous uh, during the war and all of that stuff. But uh, he was showing like the translations. He was doing lectures of Steiner, uh, in which uh, C.S. Lewis did respond to. And, and it influenced him. It influenced J.R.R. Tolkien and Charles Williams and that whole Dyson and that whole circle of people. They were aware of these things. but that C.S. Lewis had said to Owen Barfield, he saw it, he, he knew what it was, but he was too old to, to start over, that he had already had a, a, an arena in which he could comfortably dwell and deal with the, the Christian impulse. And that Rudolf Steiner, it was too late in life for him for he'd have to uh, extract himself from what he was doing is basically what he was saying and then start from scratch all over again. Cause it really is like, you really are starting from scratch. You start reading Steiner because you'll, you'll open up a book and you'll read a page and then you get to the bottom of the page and you go, wow, what just happened? <laughs> and it'll even happen to you when you've been studying it for uh, as long as I have for 45 years or 50 years or what have you. So, there is that whole idea. In fact, I say, don't do it while you're driving. Don't listen to like the wonders of the world lecture cycle while you're driving. Like Joe Viscotti was telling me the other day, I told you this story, I think, but it's funny because he was listening to that. He says, you know, it's, it's so kind of cosmic that he was, he, tried, he was driving and it was like he was floating away, you know? So you don't want to uh, dwell on the realms that normally you're in the realm of dream when you're driving a car. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I still think we've got to be careful of other people's opinions being equated with materialism. Uh, they might just be different. Um, I know materialists, as I say, I mean, with the Cambridge atheists, they are hard empirical scientists. All of this is fantasy. There's not a single shred for them of sense or meaning yet. But that gives, see, that gives it an interesting thing because Ritter Steiner doesn't tell you to avoid it. He just tells you to be able to recognize something as what it is. Remember, he was uh, Ernst Haeckel, the, the, really the progenitor of uh, Charles Darwin. Uh, you know, he thought of Rudolf Steiner as his protege. And then all of a sudden, Rudolf Steiner starts giving lectures at the Theosophical Society, and Haeckel's like, what the? <laughs> you know, so it's like, uh, but Rudolf Steiner goes on to say in regard to that, he said that, well, it was through considering the ideas of, of Haeckel and the people dealing with that whole idea of evolution, which was really a development out of the, the mor morphology of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, as most people know, is really central to the work of Gustav Steiner. And he said he took the ideas that he was receiving from researchers like Haeckel to the spiritual world, that you could take ideas, uh, bring them in, and then take them into the spiritual world and, so to speak, sleep on it and see what the spiritual world brings you as a reply. And Rudolf Steiner said his, his, one of his five main books the Occult Science and Outline, or Esoteric Science and Outline is now titled, was the fruit of taking the ideas of Haeckel and Darwin and all that to the spiritual world. And the response is the content of that book, 
which is the most complete layout of what I had described earlier about the sevenfold chain of planetary conditions of which the Earth is the fourth. And so that there is a metamorphosis, but it's different from the Darwinist view. And it's, it's also creationist, but it's different from the typical creationist view. So that it's, it's its own uh, view of, of these things. And so it gets a little messy when you try to plug them in together because uh, one doesn't necessarily know how to do that and, and still have it be truthfully uh, in relationship to the ideas and the experience. See? So, and then you don't want to be a bully about the whole thing. But there's a great deal in scripture that Rudolf Steiner says mankind won't even understand until the end of Earth's evolution, that scripture is intensely complex. And, and there's a... It, unbelievable depth uh, that's that's expressed in there. Like, for example, you go to the Gospel of Mark and, and Rudolf Steiner makes a point. I've made this on other times, but it's, it's real key, is that when Jesus decides to go and, and work in his healing ministry, it's around sunset. That's when he does it, right? At the end of the day, he goes down like by the Sea of Galilee or where have you, and he sees people for healing. And Rudolf Steiner said, well, there's a very cosmological reason why he does it at that time of the day. It's that, that those sunset forces are very much tied into that whole mystery of healing on, on a cosmic level. And you see that Christ is working with as a cosmos. And, and through initiation, you have to become the cosmos. Okay, that's really what we're looking at here. Because once you have, have worked on your development to where you started to work your individual uh, Christ in you, your, your, your curios into your vehicles, into your astral, etheric, and even physical, although much later, that it becomes an expression of something that, that is related to the divine spiritual beings. And so that when one enters into thinking about these things, you enter into relationship with those things. When you look back, it looks back at you. It's, it's, it's kind of like that quote, but on a, in a positive sense, that quote of Nietzsche's, you know, be careful uh, looking into the abyss because they'll look back at you. You know, it's like, and so there is that. And it can be quite terrifying for somebody who is ill-prepared, you know. And so this is, this is like, like the priest said to, to uh, Joe, he says, well, yeah, Rudolf Steiner, that's for the adult Catholics, <laughs> you know. It's not everybody's ready at this stage to deal with it. Right, I held the bottle up to prove it was only mineral water. Um, in case anybody's wondering, um, I'm very dry and I've still got a bit of a cough. Um, yeah, I mean, my trouble with the Cambridge atheist attitude is they're not looking at it deeply enough. I mean, if it's all fantasy, which by definition it can't be, it's it's partly philosophy, it's partly history, it's partly culturation, it's partly the culture of, of given periods and times, you know, therefore it's not simply that. And if one's thinking that the more abstract elements are, are fantasy, then we need to look at what fantasy actually is, what it's doing and what it means. Because the, the quote from Einstein you mentioned earlier, I think is very telling. And, and certainly the Freuds and the Jungs of the world make a great play, not only of myth, which is not fantasy, uh, but fairy tales as well. Um, and I think their findings, you know, what's the difference between them and, and say, um, a normal cleric? And I'm not wishing to put down normal clerics, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I started reading at the moment Carl Jaspers. Um, I've always had a thing about the existentialists. Because, I, you know, once your back is against the wall, and it's not with the existentialists, it is with the nihilists, you know, what do you believe? Is there anything? What do you believe? That is not always an unhealthy position. That is actually quite motivational. I don't go that far. Uh, my, my, I'll just finish this picture. My, my interest was always with the existentialists because they ask questions with the right type of balance. 
Um, and reading Carl Jaspers, I mean, obviously I knew of his work. Um, and I knew that not only was he a practicing psychiatrist for most of his career, but he was also a philosopher and a theologist. Um, all of a sudden seeing myth and, and fantasy, particularly maybe fantasy, in the work with his with his patients, which he discusses, you know, maybe the, the total materialists need to take a, a step back and actually ask themselves what it is they're saying and why. And does it hold water? Because curiously, I don't think it does. Handing back to you, John. Yeah, Carl Jasper, interesting, interesting case. Very highly respected, uh, but uh, philosophically a Thomist, if I, if I recall. And so that's interesting, being a St. Thomas is in reference to St. Thomas Aquinas, the the big ox that he was referred to. He was a big, he was a big man. He was, but he's an interesting character. And, but what is, what is Thomism center around? The second most quoted source in the Summa Theologia is uh, the writings of uh, Dionysos the Areopagite works on the celestial hierarchies, the divine names, and also the ecclesiastical hierarchies related to that tradition. So again, we're back with the angels again. And, and like uh, Joe, again, go to Joe again, he goes around and he, he's in the habit of asking people, do you believe in angels? Just to see if they say yes or no. He says, they almost always say yes, okay? Well, that's that's very interesting and very telling. And I, what I would say to your atheist friend is, do you believe in angels? Because if if they can't conceive that there's something that that is living, that lives in a realm that you can't see, uh, because your your whole range of sensual activities in a very limited part of the spectrum, that if you can't even conceive of that, then you're not utilizing the kinds of ideas it would take to understand what I just said. And so th there's really no conversation to be had. It's like you're talking to, it's like talking to somebody in France, you know, they will insist on speaking French. <laughs> no swines the Frenchies. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm not wishing to name names or, 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 or out people. Um, certainly most of the atheists, Cambridge atheists I'm referring to, are actually deists, whether they realise it or not. You know, there's sort of something somewhere. Um, one or two of them are hardline, but you, you think, well, okay, you've just ended up with a series of questions you can't answer. Therefore, it's not really that practical and helpful because you've snookered yourself philosophically and you sort of realise that and there's no, no room for you to manoeuvre. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, can some of them even prove they had dinner yesterday evening? I mean, the answer is no. So you end up with this sort of absurd situation whereby you're not actually discussing anything. You know, I think they're aware of that, but they, I don't know, it's almost like this weird new type of, I'll just finish this, but kind of aggressive atheism, which, which will not be wrong, even if it's proved wrong. You know, I, I thought it was all something about discussion and something to do with unveiling truth. You know, if Jesus Christ suddenly enters the room, you are wrong. There's not room for negotiation. You know, so I, I don't understand this, this new sort. There's one British guy. I'll have his name for everybody by next week. His, his type of atheism isn't irksome. I find some of it irksome because it's childish and it's got the attitudes of a child and it's angry and silly for no reason. Yeah, and I find this guy's particular brand, I can live with it. Um, you know, and he's going around defending Christmas at the minute because, you know, he's going around saying that it's a cultural thing. You know, and he likes all the lights in the shops. He likes the trees. And, right, okay, that, that strikes me as, you know, someone you can talk to, you know, as opposed to ripping everything down I mean, it's all just another shopping day. I mean, what, what sort of progress is that? 
but I will have his name for next week. And I think that we need a discussion of that at some point. John, what is the church doing so utterly wrong that you end up with these warped, warped opinions of what religion is and what it's not? I'll hand back to you. Well, yeah, okay. I mean, it spins around that quotation of Goethe that I've shared on a few occasions, where he says, mathematicians are a kind of Frenchman. Whenever you say anything or talk to them, they translate it into their own language, and right away it's something completely different. And so, end quote. And so there you are. You know, it's a, are you really having a conversation? You know, it's the, the, and that's the, the challenge is it goes back to like, uh, there was, I saw this article about this, the head of the philosophy department at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. I mean, they're, they're talking to him about, because they have teachers there that, that teach different schools of philosophy. There's all these various schools, you know, and, and he says, well, it's challenging because they all have proprietary languages, and so they can't really talk to each other, <laughs> which I think is hilarious. And there you have it. And so what is, what is this universal language? The, and it goes back to the archaic archaicism of Lavasia's Sanzar, the, the archetypal, the prototypical language, the pre Sanskrit, a primordial tongue, you know. And so, in, in keeping with that and the old primordial tongue, uh, we're happy to be here once again on time for episode 105. And and we have David, Pastor David Perry, The Grammar of Witchcraft, his Shakespearean study, wonderful book, available on Amazon along with his other books, Caliban's Redemption, and that's his Shakespearean as poetry. And his major work is Mount Athos Inside Me, Essays on Religion. Swedenborg and the Arts, edited by the very talented Daniela Hadi Irinduced. And Daniela Irinduced also has a book himself on the philosophy of education towards an anthroposophical view. And that's a very unique uh, study on Waldorf education by somebody who's quite conversant in postmodern thinking. And so uh, that's unique. I know of no other, I mean, I'm sure there is in German because they, they have every version of everything that's academic. But uh, those are all available on Amazon and you can actually get a free uh, digital version of, of Daniela's book on, uh, on Amazon and uh, I have two books, and as most of you know, but the first book is The Arcana of the Grail Angel, The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner, The Underground Streams of Esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order, with extensive diagrams uh, began from the inspiration of uh, the handwritten and watercolored diagrams of Aaron Pfeiffer, the founder of Biodynamic Gardening, who was a direct pupil of Rudolf Steiner. And uh, also this has a foreword by my best buddy, Douglas Gabriel. That's out of print currently. I'm working on reprinting it, getting a few little challenges in the way though, like when I get a a drive that supposedly contains it, and the drive won't even open on my computer. So <laughs> that slows you down. My second book, The Arcana of Light on the Path, with a foreword by the noted astrosopher and psychologist William Bento. This has the full series of, of the Grail diagrams. And uh, you see all these tabs. And yes, I read my own books. And, uh, and there you have great many cosmological diagrams and all the Pfeiffer ones and plus a great many more that I have gleaned from the work of Rudolf Steiner. So this second book, The Arcana of Light on the Path is still available. I still have a few copies left of that first edition version and that's available on eBay here in the continental US if you're outside the US or if you're 
another inclination, you can contact me by private message on Facebook. <clears throat> or you can contact me through the academia link below. And you can also download a free PDF of the wonderful foreword by William Bento. And so uh, also I want to uh, show my gratitude, I can't find it here, uh, to people that have been so important to this and that, that this podcast has been made possible by the generous support of, of Tyla and Douglas, Gabriel and Vadim and Vivian and Tim and Neil and Christian and Mark and Mon and Druvman and Laura and Paula and Rick and Michael, and Beth and Anil and Fred and Ishtar, Anna, Russell, Mike, Lee, Kyle, Ray and Whitney, James and Marilyn and so many others over the years. I really want to thank you all for supporting our efforts here and click like and uh, subscribe to the channel and share it with people and See if we can build it. It seems as though we're, we're declining. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'm not that interesting. That's okay. I enjoy talking to myself anyway, so we can keep doing this. <laughs> and we do have a, a dedicated coterie of people that, that are here every week. And for that, we're grateful. Yeah, I'm not sure why we're declining. Um, <clears throat> my, first of all, my apologies to you and to everyone today, because the other bit of news is we've got my play opening again tomorrow, so I'm exhausted. But I don't have to do anything tomorrow, but I'm exhausted. I have to turn up. But those things take a bit of work, so I'm a, a pale shadow of my normal fat self, so forgive me, everybody. Um, I don't know why people can't take on board that this is white magic 101 um because that's clearly what we're we're discussing and it's clearly what we're skirting around 90 percent of the time <coughs> excuse me a second john um and i find that interesting i find the penchant in britain uh not speaking of the us because i don't know it well enough but for but, but the dark arts, incredibly worrying. Um, you know, it, there is a great deal of interest in the paranormal per se, uh, which I personally find a little worrying, not for normal clergy reasons, actually. Um, you know, what happens at 90% of these meetings? Zilch, nothing, the end, right? Uh, that doesn't mean nothing ever happens. Um, and the type of people most actively involved, I've talked about this to my dear chum, Brian Cano, Brian J. Cano, uh, what was in America's most haunted good, good buddy of mine. Um, and I met him, I met him a couple of times, first time at Paracon UK, way, way back, which was uh, organized by Matt Hall, an American soldier uh, who had been in military intelligence, as far as I know. Very good bash. Meeting the sort of people, and I'm not having a go. I'm not having a go. Meeting the sort of people that were making this a, a, a sort of 24 7 activity. My worry, look, if you want to get into television, get into television. You know, start acting, send someone a script, do auditions, do whatever. Don't turn into a bastard and stamp, you know, and treat everybody badly. Sorry, just don't do it. Um, and that really, I thought, was a lot of the motivation behind some of the paranormal teams, as they call them here. Um, also, what type of research are you going to, what type of results are you going to come up with if that's really the motivation? You know, you want to get on the box, you want to get on the goggle box, you want to make a name for yourself. Well, if that's if that, I mean, they're, they're poor people without the benefits of an extended education, if there's such a thing as a benefit from it. Um, you know, people of humble origins. I mean, all of those cliches, forgive me for putting it that way, shorthand, they're people who could be given a lot more in life. I've never met a, a, a person who wasn't bright. I've never met a person that didn't have loads of potential. I met loads of people that have had that either stilted or crushed. Uh, and sometimes TV opens up vistas, at least in their minds, their own minds. 
um, that will sort of put that all to rights. I mean, certainly my dear friend Alan Cox, who has mostly shined clear of that type of exposure, a, a very gifted psychic, very gifted spiritual healer. I mean, I'm, I'm leading up to saying he knows, he knew Derek Acora, who was on the British version of Most Haunted. Um, actually, nobody doubts Derek is the real deal. Derek is a medium. Derek is a psychic. Derek, darling, read the small print. Read the small print. It, I'll just finish this, but he, he burnt himself. You know, what you can't do is turn up to a haunted gig and then pick up nothing. You know, you, you, producers don't like it, the end. It's really bad viewing. And the you know, the small print will kill you, which it did. It did with him. Back to you, John. Well, the first in the series of recent uh, biographical podcast I've done with Douglas, he, he, he's, he describes that you know, he really was an exorcist in the church. And that, that was his entry into it because his mentor, who he was sent from his family to with this priest, and it, he ended up finding out later that this priest, Father William, was the, the leading uh, exorcist in North America, and that he ran and he ran like all these like monasteries, and he was like a big big deal. He had the largest formation school. Uh, it was down in Missouri that was the largest priest formation school in uh, America. And, but he he does recount uh, events during exorcism where there's things flying around the room. You know, I mean, I I don't I don't know how to tell people, but that just because you haven't seen something doesn't mean it's there. And it and on the other hand, it doesn't mean that you should seek it out because you really don't want to be somewhere where there's things flying around the room if you could help it. Well, I mean, you know, I've been in places where there's invited to loads of things like that. Um, I, I no, my answer nearly all the time is no, 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 and no. Um, I, I don't see why I need to freeze my ass up in a warehouse, deserted warehouse in the middle of the night. I'm sorry, and have you bought a flask, you know, a flask of coffee? The answer is normally no. Um, I will say I know ectoplasm exists because I've seen it. Um, and what it is, what what we saw was something very, very odd, which goes back to the original spiritualists' descriptions. Um, it, it's amber in colour. It's nearly electrical. It runs across the ceiling. It normally starts above the head of the medium. It runs across the ceiling at great speed and then suddenly drops to the floor and disappears. Um, that was the original descriptions. I've seen it with my own eyes, so I don't need anyone to say, you know, uh, oh, that's a story. No, because I've seen it. Um, what that is and how you get there and what that means, I have no idea. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to know more. Um, but, you know, if you're really into the paranormal, I think it's good to be careful and not go into it for the, for the wrong reasons. A career is a bad reason to go into that type of investigation. And, yeah, I know Douglas, a formidable man. Um, you know, I'm not talking about people with a, with a strong calling um, that the church appears to, to, to vindicate. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, sadly, those people, if you don't have much to risk, maybe you're not too worried about the results, um, which is an increasing phenomenon in this country. You know, push and push and push because it doesn't matter. Uh, your life is so degraded and so shallow and there's not much opportunity and probably never will be. Um, you know, that's that's the type that worries me. That's developing here in numbers the i don't like the word fascination it seems wrong the attraction to the the black light the dark light seems to be growing here as this country appears to be sinking into national atheism uh, of the most illiterate and unthought type um you know i mean i, I think that there's a, nearly a perfect storm 
coming in this direction. It may have already started. Uh, the social contract is in tatters. Uh, there is no collaboration between the various classes to speak of anymore. Um, and they're all self-serving and getting nowhere. Well, that's the end of things. I'll just finish this, John. Uh, and, you know, you well, I'll leave it at that. I mean, you know, the perfect storm leading to an intrusion of darkness and darkness in those areas amongst the vulnerable. I mean, if ever there was a time to listen to a show like this, there is hope, there is light. This is White Magic 101. Never give up, never despair. Stay with us. This is the time. Please like and subscribe. Handing back to you, John. Yes, the... the in getting into a wholesome relationship, you know, uh, Rudolf Steiner in his lecture on the origin of evil of uh, Berlin, November 22nd, 1906, it's in Collected Works 232, but he says, Lucifer brought love into connection with the self and self-love was added to self-consciousness. Man would never have obtained a warm self-consciousness without Lucifer thinking and wisdom now entered into a service of the self and there was a choice between good and evil love must turn to the self only in order to set the self in the service of the world the rose may adorn herself only in order to adorn the garden that must be inscribed deeply into the soul in a higher occult development good could have been realized without lucifer but not freedom in order to be able to choose good, man must also have the bad before him. It must dwell within him as the force of self-love. But self-love must become love of all. Then evil will be overcome. And so there you have it in a nutshell. The, probably the briefest explanation. Uh, the only one that's briefer is uh, the last words of St. John. Uh, love you one another, you know, and so that's that's the ball of wax right there. And that that love, what is that love? You know, again, we keep talking about wonder, awe, and reverence. Well, you could say that that's the reverence part. That's the love, because that's really what what the love is an expression of is that. And uh, but you think it's something else because of your limited perspective but actually it's your relationship to that which is worthy of reverence. And speaking of reverence, uh, we're, we're drawing to the end of our show here. And if David would be so kind and lead us into a prayer to cap it off with that mood of reverence. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always darkest before the dawn. We must never forget that. Um, and the minister side of me is very aware that there's a great deal of work to be done you know, uh, nihil desperandum. There's a great deal of work to be done. What a joy to be living in these times. You know, we mustn't be despondent. I too wish this show had a bigger viewing and it wasn't falling in numbers. There's, you know, I think people are being told, people with humble origins in this country, not speaking about America, that because they've got humble origins, they've no right to think and they've no access to real books and real education and don't bother your silly little heads with it anyway. I mean, that's an increasing attitude of the powers that be here. And I just wish I could say to people, if more people in those circumstances, you're a child of God. You're a child of the universe. You have a brain, you have an imagination, you have a golden intelligence and a warm heart. Don't be afraid. But the ability, the chance to do that at the moment is is shrinking in this country. Prayers are needed. Um, a prayer I'm looking at in front of me this time. Uh, it's called the prayer of good over evil, light over dark. So would you bow your hearts with me for just a few moments? It's very, very brief. Beloved, fill the heart with the oil of love. Place in it the wick of single-pointed mind. Light it with no the knowledge of truth and remove the darkness of ignorance, ar of ignorance around you. Just as one lamp can light many lamps, let each youth kindle, each man remember, 
Each woman embrace this light in so many hearts. May the joy and peace of Christ be with you all until we meet again next week. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. And that's yet another episode, episode 105. And oh, by the way, if you're interested, you can buy us a cup of coffee at paypal.me forward slash D Perry 777 or paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell. I don't always remember everything, and I guess that's okay.